Blessings to you all on this first Sunday of the church's year. The church year begins with Advent, this season of expectation that leads to Christmas. I am Pastor Susie Todd, and I offer you welcome on behalf of myself, Pastor Bob, who's on vacation, and Pastor Jackie, who is homesick today. We are glad that you have chosen to worship with us, either in person or online. For coffee drinkers, I want to assure you that coffee is okay during worship, regardless of whether you, whether you are in the building or lounging on your couch at home. I trust that you have all had your fill of turkey, and now you are ready to begin baking Christmas cookies. No bakes are my favorite, just in case you're wondering what to get me for Christmas. Though I do like those Buckeyes, too. And you know those rosette cookies, those little fried ones with the powdered sugar? Those are good. And, well, who doesn't like a good Jingle Bell-shaped cookie with frosting and those little crunchy decorations on top? Oh, and shortbread. Shortbread's good. Man, I want, want, want. That's me and my relationship with Christmas. I want snow, but only on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I, I want packages and presents to unwrap, but I don't really want any more stuff at my house. I, I, I want a feast of rich and decadent food, but I don't want to clean the kitchen. I want family gathered around my dining table but I don't want my grandkids to have to leave their toys on Christmas morning. I want, I want, I want. Tis the season. As a culture, we rather encourage this. I mean, when we're little kids, they have us write lists of our wants to Santa with great anticipation. I remember when my youngest daughter, Madeline, was about five years old. Her Christmas list was limited to a gold dog, roses, and a million dollars. <laughs> Santa was not at all sure what a gold dog meant, and Madeline was unable to offer any clarification, so she got a lot of roses that year, not a million dollars. Sometimes we get what we want, and it's not what we imagined at all. There was the Christmas when I asked for one of those big Victorian doll houses. I had images of working chandeliers, intricate curio cabinets, Persian carpets, and, and curved divans in the sitting room. And when I unwrapped my Christmas presents, I discovered that the beautiful Victorian came in a flat pack and was bare wood that needed assembling and money, lots more money, to acquire shingles and siding and all the lovely things that I had dreamt of. It wasn't like I imagined it at all. That very first Christmas, it left the world with some of the same sense of longing. For thousands of years, the Jewish people longed for a savior to come and rescue them. They had a long history of being invaded, conquered, persecuted, and enslaved. They had suffered through generations of struggle and, and believed that the Messiah was going to rain down justice immediately upon arrival. And we see this in so many of the prophets. So hear this from Isaiah 2. It's verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, Amos' son, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted up above the hills. People will stream to it. Many nations will go and say, Come, let's go to the Lord's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's path. Instructions will come from Zion, the Lord's word from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of the mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk in the Lord's light. 
but that's not exactly the way it happened. Isaiah says in verse 2, people will stream to the Lord's house. And don't we long for that in this time when the U.S. church membership dropped below 50% for the first time ever just last year. In verse 4, Isaiah says, God will settle disputes of mighty nations. And don't we long for a country where workplace disputes are not being settled with guns and break rooms. Verse 4 goes on to say they will no longer learn how to make war. And we long for a world where the U.S. doesn't have to spend $800 billion on a military budget. See, Jesus was born two millennia ago, and, and we still long for the world that Isaiah promised. It is not the way the world looks today. In Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, the Pharisees point out to Jesus the way that their longing and their expectations have not been met. And Jesus gives them a reply. Pharisees asked Jesus when God's kingdom was coming. He replied, God's kingdom isn't coming with signs that are easily noticed. Nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is. Don't you see? God's kingdom is already among you. According to Jesus, the kingdom has come, and we fail to recognize it. The kingdom doesn't look like Isaiah or the Pharisees thought. It's not marked by quaking mountains and melting weapons. Perhaps our expectations, our longings, blind us to the blessings of this present kingdom. Do we get so absorbed in the idea of what we think life should be like that we lose the ability to see the beauty of what life is? Just a few days ago, most of us gathered for Thanksgiving with friends and family. The idealized picture is everyone gathered around a bountifully full table, laughing and loving easily. But for many of us, uh, dare I say most of us, something was missing. Somebody was missing. Maybe because of death or distance or, or illness, incarceration, or just estrangement. There, there's no point in denying the grief of the empty chair. We can't bury our pains. They'll come back to haunt us in the form of depression or anger or addiction. We have to acknowledge the unmet longing and hold it with the same sacredness that we hold the promise. Longing and peace can and do exist together. And both have the power to define our experiences of the world. Where the Pharisees saw failure or maybe even felt betrayal in their longing, Jesus taught them awareness in the longing. Don't you see, he asked, the kingdom of God is among you. Now, I'm talking in a church, so I see a lot of people who affirm a strong belief in God's kingdom come. If you're watching online, maybe you came to worship with this same sense of faith that these people in the pews carry. But some of us, some of us here and some of us out there, we carry a pretty hefty sized serving of longing too. We want. We want our relationships mended. We want our bodies healed. We want justice in our economic and political lives. We want clarity for our futures. We want. In the last verse of the Isaiah reading, it says, Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. Don't you see, asked, Jesus asked the Pharisees, and Jesus asked us, 
Even amidst our longing, even when we find it difficult to discern God's presence, God is with us. Even when nothing is the way we expected it, the kingdom is among us. Even when the world feels like chaos, the light of the Lord shines. Perhaps you remember Elizabeth from the birth story of Jesus. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. She and her husband, Zechariah, wanted to have children. Now, I imagine they had this longing that accompanied a vision of a sweet little life in their sweet little small town with their little children filling their home. I, I suspect they imagined that their first son would follow in the father's footsteps and, and be a fine and respectable priest in the local temple. But that's not the way it happened. Zechariah and Elizabeth were unable to have children for decades. And one day, as Zechariah is doing his duties at the temple, he is visited by an angel who tells him that Elizabeth is bearing his child. But Zechariah is skeptical because both he and Elizabeth are old by this time. Because of Zechariah's skepticism, the angel makes him unable to speak for the duration of the pregnancy. He's unable to question. He's unable to seek answers from his peers. He's unable to interact with most of the people around him. He's probably even unable or at least limited in his ability to work. Not the way you want it when you're expecting your first child. I'm sure that is not how they pictured this pregnancy to go. Then in Luke 1, verses 39 through 45, immediately following Mary's pregnancy being revealed to her, we read this. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The loud voice she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have the honor that the mother of the Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed that the Lord will fulfill the promises he made to her. See, Elizabeth's pregnancy did not resemble the one she had longed for. But when she spotted the tiniest ray of God's light, the child in her womb leapt. She knew God's presence in a way that defied her expectations. No mountains rising, no choirs of angels singing, just the subtle joy within her. The peace that passes all understanding. And she responded to it. I remind you that that final verse of the Isaiah reading says, Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the light of the Lord. Now, I know this is not the exact life that you have longed for. But it's the only life you're going to get. Will you sacrifice it at the altar of your longing? Or will you choose to walk it out in the peace of the Lord's light? The kingdom of God is already among us. We get to choose whether we will step out of the shadows of this world and into the light of God. We can bend toward the light. We can step toward the light. Or we can dance in the light. But each time that we choose the Lord's light, God's kingdom becomes progressively more illuminated to us. It becomes more real to us. Our steps, even those into unknown territory, become easier. And our longing begins to pale in the face of our growing peace. So, how do we find that splinter of God's light when darkness seems to surround us? How do we find peace on our unimagined journey? 
Here are some of the things that have helped the saints who have come before us. One, take life one day at a time. If you've been in recovery groups, you've heard this one before. You cannot have peace and focus too far ahead. The anxiety of what might happen is a peace destroyer. One strategy for this is what is called grounding yourself. If you start to feel yourself getting worked up about the next meeting, the next hour, the next day, stop your brain and become very present in the moment. Name your senses. I see people in the pews, lights on the ceiling, red carpet. Name your senses. Say, I hear, I hear Susie's voice, the hum of a speaker, the cough of a member. I smell, enlist what you smell. You get the idea. This helps bring you back to the present moment, and it opens up for you the possibility of taking the next right step. Number two. Don't let other people drag you down. Don't get caught up in the drama of other people's lives. Their bad day does not need to be yours. You can sympathize, you can console, you can love them, but if you have healthy boundaries, your peace is not dependent on somebody else's peace. Number three, find the positive. Not in a Pollyanna-like way, this is a deep faith and belief that something good is always present because God is in the world. And I don't mean to say at all that the terrible thing that is going on in your life has a good side. Some things, frankly, are just terrible. But finding the positive means that even in the midst of the negative, there are things that are positive can be as simple as the warm sun coming through your bedroom window on your, onto your pillow, the smell of coffee in the morning, the hush of a snow-covered world, laughter of a child in a hospital waiting room. Because where your attention is, your mood will follow, whether that's peace or longing. Number four, give yourself a break. No one can be peace-filled all the time. Give yourself a break from the world's expectations. If you, if you need to break down and cry, do it. If you need to lament to God like the psalmist, do it. If you need to lock yourself in your bedroom for a day and hide under the covers or eat a whole bag of Cheetos, do it. There is no shame in being human. Forgive yourself for being human. Number five, pray. I know, shocking, right? The pastor recommends that you pray. Who could have guessed that one? But hear me out. I want you to pray with a lot more listening than talking. If you need to lay things before God, go ahead and get it out of the way. But then, give at least twice as much time to listening as you do to talking. Now, silence may not be the best way for everybody to listen. You might, you might do better by repeating a short phrase like, may the peace of Christ be with me, or inhaling, Lord, have mercy, and exhaling, Christ, have mercy, or, or the king, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's my most common one. But breathe. Breathe into that prayer space. Breathe into that unknowing, that surrender, that listening. Come into harmony with God rather than demand that God come into harmony with you. And the sixth is like it. Know that God is with you. Most of us have lived long enough to know that life's journey will never be what we expect. Life will always dole out surprises, pleasant and unpleasant. The glorified, unrealistic holiday expectations make that glaringly obvious this time of year. And we know that the darkness will always be on the periphery waiting for us to trip and fall out of the light of God. So, 
While we don't know how the journey will go, we don't know how often or how hard we're going to fall, we do know where the story is going to end. It's been promised to us. It's going to end in the kingdom of God. On this first Sunday of Advent, we begin our Christmas lists with this. Dear God, I want that irrational peace that passes all understanding, that supersedes all circumstances. Amen.